Our, my special guest today is Nate Klosterman, winemaker at Argyle in Oregon. Nate, how are you today? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Doing fine. Uh, you were uh, in a, a beautiful spot there. You were right, right outside the winery? Uh, yep. Here at the winery in, uh, in Newburgh, Oregon. Okay. Uh, I don't have a big map, I'm sorry, but w tell me exactly where Newburgh is. Uh, Newburgh is kind of the first little town. If you come down from Portland, uh, driving into the Willamette Valley, uh, yeah. you come down uh, Rex Hill, Shehalem Mountains area, and it spills you out right into, into Newburgh. And so that's where, that's where we're at. Okay. And uh, a lot of questions they ask about the origins of the winery, but I also want to ask about you yourself because I've enjoyed the wines for a long time but I don't know much about you and there really isn't much information on the website so tell me a little bit about where you're from where you studied other wineries you may have worked for how long you've been at Argyle yeah I uh, I grew up in Wisconsin um, just north of you a few hours okay um, outside of Madison Wisconsin little town sure. called Wana Key All right um, and I went to I went to university in Minneapolis at the U of M. Right. And uh, when I got there, yep, Golden Gophers. Right. Um, I didn't know what I, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to do something kind of science uh, related, whether that was like veterinary or pharmacy or whatever. And I was kind of going down that path. And then I started home brewing in college, um, so I, which I really enjoyed that kind of combination of, uh, you know, science and beverage and and that kind of you know beautiful interaction of the two um so and your and your and your fellow roommate and students uh, enjoyed that i'm sure as well so. yes absolutely <laughs> all right uh, yeah so then i switched my major to food science um that was the closest thing i could study uh at the time at the at the university so i was thinking i was going to do beer and then kind of my last semester of school i took a wine appreciation kind of course so it's like kind of a fun simple two credit course that um piqued my interest in wine um we had a an old guy from red wing minnesota that came and spoke to the class that had a had a little vineyard and winery down on the mississippi river oh, that um spoke to us and he said oh by the way if anybody is interested i need a little you know looking for a little extra help uh on the weekends or random nights and whatnot and i was like oh well, you know i'll go I'll go talk to him and give it a try. And so, um, yeah, for last couple of months of school, I worked for him uh, just a few days a week, just kind of dabbled, got my toes wet in wine, and then kind of got a feel for it and then knew I had to move out west to uh, do it for real. And so um, I put out some feelers to move out for uh, harvest. This is in 2005. Um, a classmate of mine at the time was doing a summer internship at Argyle. Okay. And so, um, what, what, what year are we talking about here? Uh, 2005. Okay. And so I came out for harvest of 05 with Argyle as a, as an intern. Um, and then, you know, I didn't know if it would be a couple months or, or what it, whatever it would be. I ended up working out. Um, I really enjoyed the work and, they liked having me on so I you know a couple months turned into 15 years and so I've kind of I've been here at Argyle for 15 years since 05 kind of starting small in the lab in the cellar and uh, training under Rollin started the place uh, Rollin sold and so he started the winery in 87 um, and so I took over from him fully in 2013 okay. um, he kind of step back to focus on his uh label with his wife um called Rocco and so um so yeah so I've kind of been the I've been the head winemaker here since 2013. Okay yeah I, I noticed that on the website that, that Rollin Soles S-O-L-E-S established the winery in 1987 so I, I don't know anything about Rollin tell me about him and about how this all came about Argyle. Yeah. Yeah, so he uh, he's a Texan um, by birth. Um, he's wild, kind of a wild, crazy man. He's got big handlebar mustache. Yeah. Um, right. Eccentric fella that really was really fun to train under and, and work with. Um, he got into winemaking within Switzerland and Australia. And, uh, 
got got connected with some Australian guys um, in the '80s, and they were looking to make sparkling wine in uh, in America back in the mid '80s. And so he, it was kind of him his mission to go out and find where that would be um, on the West Coast in the U.S. And he kind of looked up and down Washington, California, Oregon, and uh, ended up. Uh, planting roots in the Willamette Valley and setting up shop and so and this was like in 86 and so our first harvest was in 87 um, for Argyle and that was uh, really the the drive and the the uh, idea from the beginning was to make sparkling wine um, from the beginning so we made mostly sparkling wine and made a little bit of Riesling and a little bit of Chardonnay um, as a, as the starting point, we didn't make any Pinot until the, uh, like 93, 94. Okay. So, yeah, well, I, I, I find it fascinating that, that that was his, his goal. Primary goal was to make sparkling wine. I mean, you think of Oregon yeah. and really you think of any, any winery in California, in, I'm sorry, California, California, Oregon, and, and America, sparkling wine is not usually the focus. I mean, unless they're their own. Oh, yeah. they not. But, so that, that's great. And yeah. having a taste of the wines, I'm very glad. So I'm, I'm a big champagne lover, and um, some of these examples are just stellar. So, you, you make how many different cuvées? Um, we're up to probably ten or twelve different bottlings of uh, wow. sparkling at the, at the moment. Um, you get mainly probably three to four across the country, but then we have a whole another. Um, selection for the tasting room and the club members and and uh, right. more smaller volume stuff uh, more fun stuff to get people um, checking it out and coming by and what what's the total percentage or what's the percentage of the total production of sparkling wine for Argyle changes changes on the vintage just kind of based on uh, vintage um, conditions and our kind of um, future idea of how much we want to produce but typically it's like f between 30 to 50 percent of the total production um, really? okay that much yeah okay so it's a good it's a good chunk yeah you put up a picture here of one of your vineyards you can tell a little bit about this this is the Knudsen vineyard tell us where, where, where we're at where, exactly where we're looking at elevation things like that yeah Knudsen is a really unique uh, unique vineyard um it was planted originally in the early 70s by a man named cal knutson he was an old timber man um he had old orchard he bought old orchard property in the dundee hills um and wanted to you know try his hand at grape growing and so in 70 in the early 70s uh, i think it was 72 he did his first planting um and continued that a little bit, a little bit more each year. In '74, planted even more, and if in at that point, it was the largest commercial planting of vines in the Willamette Valley. Okay. Um, it's a it's, so it's so it's in the Dundee Hills. It's it's unique because of its elevation at the time, which is pretty high elevation for around here. So it's um, I think it's up to about 950 feet elevation. Um, at the top and the lower portion is closer to uh, about four, four fifty, five hundred feet. So there's there's a nice kind of vertical um, spread across okay. the site. Mm -hmm. um, and in the old days, it was really hard to ripen um, fruit at nine hundred feet elevation for red wine or for still wine Chardonnay at that time. And so. Um, some years they got it some properly you know properly ripe and um some years it was a little more, bit more challenging with rain and colder conditions and so there was a lot of pretty intense vintage variation um in those days um when we came around uh in the 80s um looking at sparkling wine uh we with rollin um kind of met up with Cal and realized that would be a really beautiful, consistent site for sparkling wine, knowing that we didn't have to get as, as ripe as, um, as you would with, uh, with red wine, still wines. 
And so, um, so we, so when we started in, in, from the beginning, we've had this really tight partnership with uh, the Kennington family. Okay. And we, so we've been farming this site since the eighties with, in combination with the, with the Knutson family who still own the, own the property. Now, when you have sparkling wine in mind, and of course those grapes are harvested early, um, how does that affect your choice of clones that you use for Chardonnay, Pinot Noir? Um, you know, colonial wise, it, we, it, you see less, uh, less clonal differences with sparkling wine they're closer together so for for like a clone selection um it's more for us is more still wine focused okay. and right. really getting getting more with pinot and chard um so we used to we use a variety of clones for for all of the sparkling um so we don't have too much of a, a strong uh, lean to for clones for for bubbles okay and when has been the typical harvest? I, I think we all think of, of Oregon as, is a lot cooler than it is in California. So tell us about that and also about rainfall you get in a typical year. Yeah, a classical harvest, um, sparkling harvest here uh, in the Willamette would be early to mid-September. So pretty, okay. pretty comparable to champagne timing. Uh, right. But in really warmer, dry years, we have gotten into uh, late August for um, a couple of seasons. Um, so like 20, 2015, 2016, we, we dipped into the late August time. But um, more classically, it'd be like this year, we're going to be looking at more like early to mid-September. Um, and then rain-wise, we're uh, unique here. Everybody thinks of Oregon as being rainy, but the summers are incredibly dry. Um, so we we don't we'll go for two months in the summer without a without a drop of rain in some years. Right. Um, so it's it's uh, yeah it's kind of counterintuitive with the with the uh, historical kind of the what people think of Oregon in general being so rainy. Yeah, the the myth so to speak. But and at what latitude are these vineyards? We're, we're about the 45th parallel. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so Salem, 45th kind of goes right through Salem, which is where two of our vineyards are located. And then Knutson is just a touch north of that. So um, right in that ballpark. And I think Champagne is a comparison is around 47. Yeah, they're a little okay. bit, a little bit higher. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I, you mentioned, again, I'm sorry, uh, you said you have about 12 or so Uves or a little bit more? Yeah, somewhere in that ballpark. I'd have to yeah. add them all up, but yeah. Yeah, I, I was able to taste three of them, thanks to your PR firm, sending me some samples. So I had the, oh, the nice. Brut, the Vintage Brut, was the 2016. And I, we should mention also that you use Mounier or Pinot Mounier. You know, yep. Use that, it's so about 10% in that wine. Um, lovely wine, very pleasant for right now. Um, but the, the ones that I really, really thought were great, really stood out, pulled it up here. We'll start with the 2004 Blanc de Blanc. 2014, I'm sorry, it said 2004. 2014. Yeah, 2014, yep. Okay. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Are all those grapes from the Knutson Vineyard as well? Or? Uh, no, so that's, uh, that's Spirit Hill Vineyard, which um, was our newest site. Um, our, young, our youngest site. So we've been making a we've been making a Knutson Blanc de Blanc since the mid '90s. Um, Spirit Hill we started planting in uh, '08. It's an old Christmas tree farm, high elevation, windy, Eola Amity Hills. Um, so we started planting it specifically for for bubbles. Um, so this is this site is uh, cooler, even cooler than Knutson, later ripening more wind influence from the banduzer um the banduzer winds that come in from the coast uh and the soils there are, are in comparison to dundee they're they're both volcanic but the spirit hill vineyard soils are much more um in cons very variable in kind of depth and um of 
between Jory and more of the rockier soils. And so we get a little bit more of that kind of mineral tension and more citrus and um, maybe a touch more kind of seashore type character in at Spirit Hill as we, in comparison, um, up closer to Dundee, which is much deeper um, Jory volcanics. And so the, the Blanc de Blanc from up there tends to be a little bit more subtle and silky. Um, and just a little bit more um, elegant. Well, I, I tasted the wine, and it, uh, of course, the thing you look for to Blanc de Blanc is that is the varietal character. It's got beautiful varietal purity, which I really love. And there's a little bit, of, a little note of creaminess on the palate mm -hmm. too, which I thought yeah. it, this is a excellent, excellent Blanc de Blanc. So congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that little subtle creaminess is really something that we look for in in the Blanc de Blancs. Just just a little bit in the background um, to kind of fill in and give you that textural um, component, which is, that's nice that you picked it up. That's something we look for. Well, great, thanks. And then the other one I tried was the, um, which I thought is just amazing. Switch the screen here so people can see it better, but this is the extended tirage brute. This is from 2009. And I noticed yeah. it, this was disgorged just last July, which is July of 2019. So it spent almost 10 years on the lease. Yep. And, and that is a blend of primarily Pinot Noir, 59% and 41% Chardonnay. Um, tell us about that, where the grapes are from, and styling of it. Yeah, so um, at that time, most of the sparkling wine, that, that blend is, a, is predominantly Knutson. Um, in the Dundee Hills, which we looked at earlier and talked about earlier. And then uh, there's a small component of our third vineyard called Lone Star Vineyard. That's okay. also in the EOL Amity Hills, but um, a little bit lower elevation. Um, and so it's roughly maybe 80% Knutson, 20% uh, Lone Star. Um, but yeah, Knutson is the backbone of, the, of, of that wine, just bringing that high elevation elegance. 09 at the time was a really it was considered to be quite a warm, um, dry season. It, you compare it to the current era, the modern era, and it's actually pretty, you know, pretty quite similar to what we're working with these days. Okay. Um, but as a wine, the extended tirage program um, Rollin created going back um, to the original days in the 80s. So um, they were tasting, tasting the base wines and the, and the juice coming off the press. Um, we had a little relationship with the Bollinger uh, folks back in the day, and they they mentioned that this was uh, the the best or the only place they've seen outside of Champagne where you know tasting the profile of uh, of these wines that they thought would be suitable for long term aging. So that put the bug in his in Rollins' ear to That's great. It's great to hear lay down you know a small amount of wine uh for a, you know for a full 10 years rather than our usual three to four years and see what happens and so it's kind of a leap of faith to create the program um from the original days and so we released our first extended trash in of the 87 in 1997 and we've released one almost every year since then um, okay yeah, i as i mentioned I'm a, I'm a big champagne nut i mean i i, I I can't go like more than a month without champagne. Sometimes really more like two weeks, but this is, so I'm always fascinated by what other countries can do, whether it be Italy or Spain or the United States. And we've seen, you know, a number of excellent, outstanding cuvées from the United States. This, this is as good as anything I've ever had from the United States. So it was an outstanding wine. Awesome. Thank, I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, it's, um, we disgorge this, yeah, every summer basically for the fall release. So it's always our little uh, Christmas in July to be able to open these kind of riddle these down and have a look at them and figure out the dosage and get them ready for release in the in the fall. It's it's always my favorite, one of my favorite times of the year. I was gonna say there must be something to look forward to every year, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is the dosage on this particular cuvee, the two thousand nine? Uh, I believe it's uh, four grams per liter. Okay, so we're talking about extra brute, as it would the term would be used in champagne. So quite dry. But... 
we're not losing you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Did we get it back there? Yeah. Uh, four grams per liter. Yeah, we're, we're fine. Uh oh. I've got something here that says it's unstable, but I hope not. Her fingers crossed. And I noticed on your website that you make a couple other cuvées that are even more limited and more expensive. Um, yeah, so we have created, so this extended tirage is our, th so the Brute that you tried earlier, the 2016, um, the extended tirage that you're tasting now is that same, um, it's that same blend that we age an extra seven years. So it's not a, it's not a particular, um, blend or cuvee for this extended tirage. It's just the last um, portion of the vintage that we hold back, um, which is kind of, I think is a cool testament to what the quality of the, of the current brute is. Um, we've since created uh, extended tirage versions of the Blanc de, of the Blanc de Blancs, Rosé, um, Knutson Vineyard Brute, um, in much smaller quantities, but we have extended tirage versions of all of those um, that we're starting to release on a smaller level as well. So going back to like, started that in 08, 09, 10, depending on the wines. And so okay. we'll have um, even more extended tirage versions of those wines as well. And is that extended tirage rosé, is that 100% red grapes or is there Chardonnay there as well? Uh, it depends on the vintage. Some of them, some of them have uh, Meunier and Pinot um, from the from those earlier vintages, but we ha do have some Chardonnay and some of the blends as well. Okay, and I understand. It depends on the on the year. I understand you now release a still version of of Pinot Meunier as well. Yeah, we just released our first the. Uh, first bottling, official bottling of that. We've been playing around with it since 2017, trying to uh, trying to understand and relate to what Meunier means from, from a white, red wine perspective. Um, 17 was our first attempt and, and turned out it just didn't quite have enough personality and character to it. Um, so we, uh, we didn't bottle that one. Uh, 18, we lowered the yield. Um, a bit more and really opened up the canopy just to get some more sun sun exposure and some more character and um, and age that um, for 16 months and really created a really fun unique kind of fresh but also has some density um, Mounier that uh, that we just released uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm sure most people myself included are not that familiar with just distilled Mounier so can you describe that wine and sort of the characteristics, not only in terms of acidity and tannin, but in terms of the aromatic profile and flavors on the palate? Um, yeah, it's, you know, if, if you were to pour it blind for most people, they would think it was Pinot Noir. It's very, very similar. Um, but in terms of kind of more of a subtle profile, I think there's just a touch more brightness and floral character. Um, compared to the little bit more of the denser, um, more dense and spice driven character of, uh, of Pinot Noir, but they're incredibly close. And so that's part, and it's still new for us too. So we're trying to, I'm still sure. personally trying to learn what, uh, you know, what really sets those two apart. And, and where does that ripen in terms of compared to Chardonnay and Pinot Noir? Um, uh, it's kind of right uh, it depends well sparkling wine is always typically a little bit earlier um, right. it's always one of the earlier things that we pick but then we hang out then we hang the portion uh, for red wine a couple of more weeks and so it does tend to come in in comparison to the other red wines on the like the red wine pinots on the side it does come in a, t a touch on the earlier side in comparison to those as well um, so we're looking so at I'm sorry we're looking at like end of September maybe or yeah. Okay. Yeah. Depending yeah. on the vintage. But yeah. How many acres do you have planted of Pinot Meunier? Uh, we've got 10 acres at Spirit Hill Vineyard um, okay. in the Eola site. And then we've got a, another four acres of, uh, of Meunier up at, at Knutson uh, in the Dundee Hills. And so the red wine Meunier is currently all from Spirit Hill Vineyard. All right. We, we may try to do we may try to experiment with a little Dundee Hills Munier this year um, 
as well, just to see how they compare, try to do a little more learning. Are, are there other producers and other growers, I should say, in, in Oregon that are working with Mounier? Uh, there's a couple. Ivory's got some Mounier and Will McKenzie. Sure, okay. Has some as well, um, but there's not too much out there. It's funny, it's one of the, there's been, um, you know, kind of a sparkling uh, renaissance in the Willamette Valley, people making more and more sparkling or just dipping their toe into the water. And so right. um, it's probably the number one thing I get asked about from other producers is uh, number one, do you, like, do you have any Mounier you can sell us? Or number two, like, we're looking to plant some Mounier. What, uh, what do you guys have or what do you recommend? Right, right, right. So it's, it's kind of an exciting time for Mounier at, at the moment. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And we'll start with the nut house. And you, you got to tell me the origin of that name, by the way. I don't know if that describes the yeah. people you work with or, or just <laughs> the situation trying to make wine up there. But anyway, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. But the, the nut house 2018 Chardonnay from Eola Amity Hills. Tell us about that. Yeah, the name. Um... It's a little bit of a play on words with the, you know, the crazy folks. Rollins a little crazy, and all all of us Argyle folks are a little bit over the years. But the kind of the true uh, core of the name comes from the original winery, which was in Dundee, which is where the tasting room is at the moment. Was a hazelnut um, facility back okay. right. in the in the early '80s and '70s before we turned it into a winery. So um, that's where the nut house name comes from. Okay, um, originally. And so that was a style of wine that we started making in the mid nineties. Um, it was a, with Pinot and Chard, it was, uh, it was an idea to have a, a style of um, with Chard in particular, um, just a little bit more density and structure compared to um, a little bit, our spirit house wines, um, which was named after another, our uh, old, uh, tasting room on the site. It was an old farmhouse that's um, haunted by a ghost. So that's where the spirit house name comes from. Um, is, it, is it still haunted, or uh, they say it is? Yeah, I'm not over there as much as I used to be, but yeah, we get little we get little haunted stories here and there from folks. I, I suppose once up. haunted, it's haunted forever. So I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those those are kind of two styles of wines that we made in the started in the '90s. So. Um, Spirit House, a bit more elegant and refined and delicate. Uh, nut House, a little bit more muscle and structure um, and uh, kind of power, if you will. And so, uh, those so those were blends in the '90s. Um, as the vineyards have gotten older, we've kind of found the Nut House style to come from Eolamity Hills. Um, so coming from Lone Star vineyard in, in particular with the okay. with the chardonnay and the and the pinot um so the 18 the nut house shard is all from lone star so lower elevation eola amity hills fruit so it's got um it's got that little bit of generosity but still nice mineral and spice kind of characteristics from the from the ava from the winds and um that nice east it's on the east side of the hill so you get that nice morning sunshine and um, there's a real spicy character to the shards that come from that area. And you're using Dijon clones, or the Dijon clones were planted in this vineyard, right? Yep. So, yep. So, the shard was planted in, um, we have two blocks there. One was planted in 99 and one was planted in 2000, both Dijon, um, 95 and 96. And so, the Nut House Chardonnay is predominantly the 95 clone. Um, was just a little accent of 96. Okay. Um, I tasted the one yesterday, and what I liked about it, I noticed it was barrel fermented, and I am don't have as much patience, if that's the right word, for for wood notes and for oak as mm -hmm. other people do. So I, I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. I, I wouldn't have guessed it was totally barrel fermented. It, the, the wood notes are really nicely integrated. They're subdued. And, of course, it adds texture and complexity. So... First rate wine, very very nice. Cool, thank you. How was that vintage? Yeah, that's eighteen. Eighteen was warm, dry, or on the earlier side, but really just great ripe natural fruit flavors. And so getting the 
getting the pick time um, correct or just dialed in so we can get that fruit character, that fresh, vibrant fruit character to integrate with the barrels. Um, sometimes if you let it hang a little bit too long in a year like that, you can get more tropical and right. heavy. Um, so the pick, I mean, you know, the pick time is, is probably the most important part, um, kind of driving that, that style um, of shard up here where you, you know, we want the, we want the density uh, and acidity, but without being too heavy or um, tropical. I, I would say you succeeded with this wine. So let me ask a couple of ge general questions about Chardonnay. Um, were there any particular Chardonnays, be they from California or other producers in Oregon or particularly Burgundy that you kind of modeled this after? Or is it, is it really more of a case of this is, this is what nature gives us. This is what the soil gives us the clones. Um, yeah, not, not, there's no like specific uh, wines from other that we're modeling it after, but just kind of a general, there's a general feel and balance that of some, some styles and areas that we're trying to kind of get it in that ballpark, but with, with the, uh, you know, Lone Star, Neola, Amity Hills kind of unique um, contribution to that. Um, yeah. Kind of, so it, it is what it is um, in terms of the vintage, but yeah, that that weight and balance combo that we're looking for is definitely important um, with the shards. Yeah, I, I found some Merceau char character to it, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, Chassagne Mon Richet, that, that sort of thing, which is never a bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. those are. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be be considered in that kind of uh, okay. framework. So yeah, that's definitely a, um, an area we'd like to be considered in. Right, and well, and I think it's a positive that, in, in, you know, you think of Oregon, of course, people think of Pinot Noir first, and maybe they're starting to think of Chardonnay, but right now, I, it's, no one could say, hey, there's an Oregon style Chardonnay. It really is up to the producer, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of influence from the producer style, um, handling and, technique and picking is a, it definitely has a I think it has a maybe more of an effect than red wine from Pinots around the area that's you can really there's a lot of choices to be made in the, in the style from the human element as well All right and just another general question um, back to my statement about Pinot Noir is the most famous wine from Oregon Chardonnay is starting to pick up a little bit in, in popularity and and uh, and um, and you know a positive image. So where do where do you if this if you could, if you can answer it, it's a difficult question. But where do you put Chardonnay in, in terms of Oregon? I mean, how how what quality level is? And I'm not talking about yours, but just in general, that you taste. Yeah, in general, I think the quality level is incredibly high um, across a number of producers. It's just a matter of there's just not that much Chardonnay in the ground here at the moment. Um, you find these little pockets of great producers. A lot of them are in Eola Amity right next door to us with, uh, you know, Lingua Franca and Seven Springs, Evening Land and Walter Scott. And um, it's a really nice little pocket for, for Chardonnay producers in Eola in particular. Um, as a, as a whole, I think they're, I think the style is, Slowly, we're slowly finding the style of Oregon okay. that's a little bit closer over time, but it takes a long time, you know. Um, I can imagine, right. Uh, and uh, how, how many Chardonnays total do you produce? Uh, we do between six to eight different shards. That many, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, most of it is, uh, you know, smaller through the tasting room or club, but um, okay. we do... Um, we do three shards or that get a more national distribution, but still, it's like a tiny amount in the grand scheme of Chardonnay. Right. Lots of lots of excitement from wine growers and winemakers and people drinking it around here in the valley that we're trying to trying to spread the excitement across the rest of the country, and that just takes a takes a long time. Big time, right? Right. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's move on to Pinot Noir, and I. Tried a couple different ones. Again, the Nuthouse. 
which we have a bottle of here from 2018. Cool. Yep. Vintage. Yes, okay. the same uh, same vintage and same um, vineyard as the Chardonnay, so Lone Star Vineyard. Um, and so for us, for for Nut House, we're trying to, you know, we tend to be a little bit into that darker, spicier um, realm with a, just a touch of floral and and red fruit. But the vineyard itself tends to lean a little bit darker, spicier you know kind of firm structure not overly tannic but nice structure um, really sets it up well for ageability it's probably our most historically uh, probably our most ageable pinot that we've produced um, over the years and uh, I noticed on the technical notes that this is 25 percent whole cluster yep tell us about the decision on that yeah that's a newer um, we started dabbling with whole cluster in uh, 20 2014, 2015, um, just as a, an experiment to see. Before that, it was purely everything was purely destemmed. Um, but I think with these warmer, with these warmer vintages, we've been trying to re relearn how to make wines and retain freshness. And I think the whole cluster character can bring an element of freshness and spice and, and complexity that works uh, works well in the in the overall blend. And so it's. It's still kind of in, still trying to learn. For me, is mainly trying to match up which blocks of the vineyards um, tend to match up better with uh, stem inclusion than others, and so we're kind of slowly finding finding that combination. Um, yeah, and certain vintages you can do, like eighteen. Definitely, you could do way more whole cluster than compared to nineteen, which was a little bit cooler and wetter. Um, so we definitely backed off um, from a vintage perspective last year, but um, it's kind of one of those things that you feel it out as you go and decide um, kind of mid mid harvest um, how much we're going to include. But it, I, I like it as an element, a complexing element to the wines. Okay. And how old are the vines for this particular wine and, and what sort of clones do you use? Um, so... Uh, uh, Lone Star was planted and started planting in the mid 90s. Um, so 97 was the first year of planting, um, 667 and um, in 97. And then we kind of successfully slowly added on more, planted a little bit every year. And so we, we've done added in Pomard and 777. Um, and um, we have a, a 2A, it's kind of a variant of 777, a yeah. uh, little bit of Aidensville, but primarily in 115 as well. So this wine in particular is more, I tend to gravitate more towards 667, Pomard, 115. Those tend to be a little bit darker, spicier, which is the style of the wine that, for this particular wine that we tend to gravitate towards for the, for, uh, for the nut house. And, and what sort of flavors or characteristics of the, does the Pomard clone bring to the Pinot Noir as opposed to young. Yeah, Pomard, um, I, I guess maybe not, it, it tends to be darker and spicier, but I, I always get a sense of more of a sensation, like a deep longevity um, that I think is a nice attribute compared to a little bit more, like in 667 for me is a little bit rounder and um, more voluptuous, but I, lo I love the length and the tension that Pomard can can bring for us at, at Lone Star Vineyard. Kind of ties everything together, and it's more of an anchor uh, for the for the wine. Okay, I my notes. I mean, I got a lot of that black fruit, like you said, black cherry and raspberry. And again, you know, you always hear about some of the winemakers that really go crazy with new oak with Pinot Noir, and you know, Pinot Noir loves oak, but it's what about 25% new oak is that correct Do you yeah that sounds right yeah and, and, that, and uh, you don't notice the, the wood notes i mean it is very well integrated very very nice overall harmony so oh, thanks that's one thing we've been it's been interesting when we have blended this wine uh last few years we tend we do it all blind and we tend to come to this really um proportion we end up like whole cluster and new wood kind of end up being very similar to each other in, from a proportion on the blend. So whether that's like 
25 and 25 or 30 and 30. It seems to be a nice uh, match for each other that just was kind of a, something that randomly has appeared through our kind of our blind blending sessions. It's been kind of fun to see. Let's talk about the reserve Pinot Noir 2017. Okay. This is just listed as Willamette Valley. Is it a blend of several vineyards? Or? Yep, so it's blended between um, Knutson, Lone Star, and Spirit Hill. Uh, so the three, the three sites that we've been talking about, um, those are our, our kind of our, our main three sites that covers about 90, 95% of everything that we do. We have a fourth site um, down in the coastal range of uh, kind of getting down towards more like on the way to Corvallis that's just starting to come online that will become our, our fourth um, component in more recent vintages, but um, but for the so the reserve level, this wine is blended between um, Dundee and Eola, just between those three vineyards. So we get a nice kind of a snapshot of uh, volcanic soils, um, kind of mid to high elevation uh, in the Willamette Tier. It's, it's a really nice snapshot of what the Kind of a broader sense of what's happening in the Willamette for that particular year. This also has a little bit of uh, cold soak, or uh, not a little cold soak, but also a little bit of whole, whole cluster. And you use very small fermenters, don't you? Yeah, we use uh, just tiny one and a half ton tub fermenters. Um, so they're not, I, I really like them because they're small and gentle. They don't build don't build too much heat. They don't get crazy. They kind of just take care of themselves and we just monitor them and punch them down um, a little bit here and there. And uh, it's really nice kind of gentle uh, extraction and style of Pinot that we're looking for. Silky, floral, um, textural style. In, in, the, in the shorter, sorry, in the smaller fermenters, is it a shorter fermentation time? Depends on the vintage in the vineyard. Um, if they come in, if the fruit comes, it, a lot of it is, you know, the temperature and time that it comes in. Um, these little tubs don't have, um, they don't have cooling or heating. And so okay. if they come in, um, in, you know, early in a warmer part of the season in the earlier side, they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll be much quicker fermentations. If we get later into the, Late September, early October, those things tend to take a little bit longer, and so we get a nice we get a nice variation of um, kind of young or earlier, early, quick ferments and long drawn out ferments, and then we can use them to blend back and forth with each other. Okay, again, very nice wine, beautiful complexity in this wine. So, uh, how many Pinot Noirs altogether do you make? Um, probably in that ten, ten ish. Use somewhere in there. I can't keep track of them all anymore, but yeah, somewhere, somewhere in that ballpark. We're at. We've been doing some more single vineyard stuff for the tasting room and the club the last couple of years, um, as well as uh, some of these classical lens from that house, Spirit House Reserve, as well. So yeah, we're in that. Probably we've got about ten of them at the moment. Okay. Well, you mentioned visitor or the the tasting room. Sorry, but I've been conducting a num numerous webinars with California producers, but you're the first Oregon one. So what's the situation there now with, with uh, people coming to visit? Yeah, we opened, um, we opened the tasting room back up in June, um, kind of slowly just figuring out the, you know, the best protocols and safety and um, it's been going pretty well. Um, you know, and visitors, everybody in Oregon in a public space is required to, to wear a mask. Right. So if you were to come to the tasting room, you'd come in, um, you have to make, a, and we're also moved to all reservation just so we okay. can right. monitor the flow and people. So you'd make a reservation, come in with a mask and you get seated. Uh, our our um, site is nice. It's been, um, we have a lot of outdoor seating. So we're seating the majority of people outdoors here this summer. So we get some nice spacing. Um, and, uh, yeah, folks can, they can do either sparkling only flights or they can do Pinot only flights or 
mixed flights, and so we've we've got a lot of um, a lot of different options for folks that uh, that want to come and visit um, and see through see through the range of what we're doing. Okay, I, I hope you weren't drowned out by the siren there. So, I don't know if you heard that or not, but oh no, I didn't hear it. <laughs> I, we, I get that from time to time outside my house, but there's, there's been a little bit too much of that lately in Chicago. But that's another story. <laughs> yeah. We won't go into that. So, um, Riesling. You make a little bit of Riesling as well. I, I tried your 2018 again, the Nut House, um, and I know a, a number of producers in Oregon make Riesling. So, talk a little bit about that. How much do you make? Where, where are the, where's the fruit from? Um, yeah, Riesling is kind of our little pet project. Um, we don't make much of it. Maybe 500 to 1,000 cases uh, every year, and we do three to four different bottlings. So we do a nut house and a spirit house. Those are the two main ones. And then we do a, um, a dessert style Riesling called minus five as well. But um, but all the fruit is from Lone Star. Um, just, okay. We just have a few, few acres from there as well. Um, stylistically, um, the nut house Riesling is kind of more of our uh, historical style that if, if you found a Argyle Riesling from the 90s or from the 2000s we just made one back in those days it was just called Argyle Riesling and that's so the nut house is more in that style it's um, you know just tension but off dry just a touch more um, just a touch of roundness to play off of the, uh, the yeah. acidity uh, and then and it can be a mixture of uh, stainless uh, steel and barrel we, we, we've been playing around with some some barrel and some extended aging um, uh, with with the Rieslings as well. We're actually just tasting them right now, um, looking at the 2019s um, that we're going to try to get bottled here in the next month or two. Um, and then the Spirit House Riesling also comes from from Lone Star, but that stylistically we try to push it a little bit more in the drier, a little bit more savory and textural. Um, style of Riesling. So those are the two kind of side by sides. Okay. So more in Alsatian style Riesling? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think a good comparison. Let me ask you, I'm curious about what you like to enjoy in terms of dinner with a Riesling and maybe lunch, whatever. But, and also, you know, I've been writing for 20 years about wine and, and I follow certain people, certain friends that write beautifully. And you see this from time to time about, you know, Riesling is, is the greatest grape in the world and it's going to be the next big hot thing. And it never seems to be the next big thing. It's like there's more yeah. talk about it than there is actually people saying, hey, look, you know, let me have it. They're looking for Riesling when they go out to dinner or going to a store. So what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it goes kind of similar to Chard. We, we were talking about earlier, like the, the producer's hand can have a pretty big influence and much even with Riesling, even even just wider variation of styles and I think there's just a lot of confusion and uh, inconsistency of you know what people are looking for in in Riesling um, every time we pour stuff for people um, so oh, we make a Riesling and like their first re most people's first response is oh it's too sweet I'm, uh, right. I'm not into it um, and so it's kind of just got to get it in front of people once you pour it for people they love it but there's just like this hurdle um, with, I think there's probably a lot of bad sweet Riesling in the past that people have been scarred by that they're just need to get over that hurdle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They've, to, they've gone to, to uh, bad parties or bad weddings or something and yeah. <laughs> cheap Riesling. So it's sticky sweet. Yeah. Um, and you, you just make the one Riesling? Uh, no, we have, two, we've, got a couple, yeah, we've got a couple That's different right. styles. Um, yeah, right. The Spirit House and the Nut House. But um, yeah, I think of Riesling a lot from, I compare it a lot in my mind to sparkling wine. Uh, just that balance of sugar and acidity and texture and length. There's that same kind of interplay going on with Riesling that um, is quite similar without the bubbles for, for um you know, to, to compare to. So I think it's, for me, it's, yeah, it's just, there's this subtlety and balance of sugar and acidity that we're trying to, that we're trying to find. And, you know, you can tease that out with more barrel time or lees texture or, right. 
uh, fresher, tighter. So there's a lot of options, but it's really, it's, it's fun from a winemaker perspective because you can have a lot of hands-on choice. And it's, I, uh, I like that comparison. I really never thought of that. I, as I said, I love sparkling wine. I love Riesling too, but never really put the two together, but that's, that's, that's good insight. So, and then yeah. I should point out, you also make a Pinot Noir Rosé. Uh, yep. We just did, uh, we've made a sparkling rosé for, since we started, but, um, we, last year sort of dabbling in a little bit of still wine rosé. And so this is a, a newer, newer project, um, kind of playing around with techniques and, um, you know, different blocks from different vineyards. And it's been a fun, um, fun exercise to, to figure out, you know, different textural balance things with with rosé as well so the it's 100 percent pinot um but we've we some of it is picked um closer to to like a base wine um style or ripeness point and pressed directly so it's more of a clear white base okay. some of it is uh destemmed and soaked on its skins for um for up to seven to ten days and then pressed and then some of it is that right. is made um, more picked, picked at a little bit riper level and and direct pressed, and so we get these different textures and um, profiles of rosé, Pinot Noir rosé that we brought back together in a blend that I think is um, it's pretty exciting and fun style of rosé. So it's uh, yeah, I'm excited for it. It's it's new and fun and right. I was mentioning with the, with going back to recently for a second with with food. So let's let me just pick your brain about your your thoughts on food, not only with Riesling, but also Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and then of course the sparkling wine. So that's a broad question, but any specific yeah. real hot, you know, really just perfect matches that you've had with these wines. Um, I mean, my first go to is you know Pinot and and mushrooms that we grow really great. Um, mushrooms out here in the coast range you can go forage for that I just that's my probably absolute favorite combination okay. is Oregon Oregon okay. piano and chanterelle mushrooms any cool. whatever dish there and um, I'm a sucker for that um, Chardonnay Oregon Chardonnay uh, I my favorite combination with that is uh, Dungeness crab um, another thing we can get out here on the Oregon coast that I just I just love the the tension of the Chardonnay and the creaminess of the Dungeness crab really that interplay is incredible. Um, Riesling wise, um, you know, some of the that one can go a lot of different directions. Um, I tend I like to cook more. Um, I'm actually probably going to do some of this tonight. Probably um, do some more Asian influenced. Uh, uh, dishes probably do something more like uh, Vietnamese style um, noodle rice noodle. Um, I imagine that would be perfect combination. Yeah. Um, in Riesling, I yeah, I, just, I really love that. All sorts, all throughout the that uh, kind of network of uh, food styles, I, I really gravitate yeah, towards. Asian fusion cuisine, right? Right. Yeah. And as far as the, let's look at sparkling with Blonde de Blanc as opposed to the um, extended Tirage. Two, I would think there would be a very different range of, of, of foods, food stuff. Yeah, Blanc de Blanc, I'd sort of gravitate to oysters for um, the Oregon coast, uh, the um, knee tarts, oysters. I really love that combination. I think the a little bit more tension in the Blanc de Blanc um, pairs well with the creaminess of the oysters. And for the extended Tirage, um, that one I, I like to just drink on its own. It's so complex on its own. I don't pair that one as much with food. Um, I just think there's just so many layers in that thing that I just kind of like to yeah. sit and sip and think about um, more, more of that one on its own. Um, but for Pinot-based sparkling wines, I like to pair them either with rosé or with like a, a Blanc de Noir, pairing those with more traditional foods that you would do with um, with red wine Pinot Noir, you can get some of those very similar pairing components, but with a more more tension, more vibrant um, acidity with the something, with something the, like uh, tuna maybe or yeah, absolutely okay. tuna, salmon, um, yeah. yeah, sushi, um, yeah, that 
that's a fun. We, we occasionally do all sparkling, uh, all sparkling only wine dinners and and pair pair across the board, and that's really fun to kind of expand people's uh, idea of what uh, what you can compare can pair sparkling with. Uh, most people, you know, just want to. Well, sip it before dinner, but they're, they're really great food pairs, pairing wines. I can imagine. I, I, well, but between the sparkling wine dinners and then all those food stuff you mentioned you can get along the coast and the mushrooms and things, I, I've got to get out there. <laughs> yeah, man. <So. laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since I've been in Oregon. But last couple of minutes we have here, just um, I'm not going to worry about business or anything right now. Everybody, you know, has had a tough time with it. But have you noticed as you're out in nature, when the last, you know, four or five months, you know, has, has this coronavirus situation, has, have you noticed any changes in terms of the, the local habitat or, you know, I talked with a producer from Tuscany a couple of days ago and he, he noticed there were a lot more animals that were, were coming, you know, where, where he could see every day that he didn't normally see. Any, anything like that or any, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I can't say I've seen a, huge difference in animals i think we've, we've got a lot out here um already i would say maybe tend to see more i've seen maybe more uh deer coming into town and walk like walk on the streets and just <laughs> being really? like more nonchalant um yeah eat in the neighbor's garden that kind of thing and okay, just, yeah <laughs> um but yeah they're i think that i have no idea if they're related but i feel like um been a, an increase of uh bumblebees and oh, just like flowers huh. that have, just feel more vibrant this year i have no idea okay. if they're related or not but i have a, i just have a nice feel that that's been increased this year um which has been a nice nice uh thing to take in with the sunshine yeah yeah bees are bees are necessary and they're yeah. good so that, that's great to hear so Great. This has been, uh, we're at the end of our time. This has been a lot of fun. You're easy to talk to and very well prepared. And you seem very content and I'm guessing very happy doing what you're doing. So enjoy the wines very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thanks a lot. It was nice to talk to you. Okay. And, and we'll uh, keep our, keep our fingers crossed for a great harvest this year. Yeah. Well, here's, here's, here's open. It's the weather is really the last couple of days. The mornings have been incredibly just have that fall feeling, that cold feeling that is okay. getting the harvest feel in the in my bones just based on Mother Nature starting to shut down. So it's a good there feeling. You go. There you go. Yeah. That's, that's a good feeling, I'll bet. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks again. Appreciate cool. it. Thank okay. you very much. Talk soon. Bye.